Hello and welcome to this virtual presentation. Thanks to Andor for organizing this meeting and giving us a chance to all connect as a community and share our science. My name is Ripta Arora and I'm a faculty at Michigan State University where I study early maternal fetal interactions using mouse as a model system. Today, I will be telling you about the insights we have gained from imaging the implanting embryo, the red circular disc here, or the blastocyst, and its immediate uterine environment. In this case, the gray structure is the uterine lumen that holds the embryo. The colorful budded structures are uterine glands that provide nutrition to the embryo before the placenta forms. A little bit of historical perspective. In the earliest times, when cadaveric dissections were not permitted by the church, one had to guess based on outward appearance or based on animal studies. The hypothesis then was that the uterus is connected to the breasts and the uterus is lined by a series of tentacles or suckers and that's what the baby feeds on. And when the baby is born, it gets the same nutrition by suckling on the breasts. Later, um, artists started to collaborate with clinicians and would document anatomical structures in detail. These are pictures by Leonardo da Vinci and even still the uterus was always showed connected to the breasts. Then came the breakthrough advent of microscopes. That's when we were able to visualize cellular structure in detail. Fast forward to today, we can visualize the mouse embryo or a mammalian embryo developing from a two cell stage to a blastocyst stage as shown in this movie. The embryo is a transparent structure and thus can be placed under a microscope. It's being cultured in a dish under a drop of oil in media. That's why it's stable and doesn't move and you can record the whole process until it forms a blastocyst. While this can happen in a dish, in nature, it actually happens inside the uterine structure. This is the cartoon of a human uterus, which has a single chamber. The uterus has the luminal and glandular epithelium. The outward layer is the myometrium or the muscle, and the layer between the epithelium and the muscle is the mesenchyme or the stroma. While it's easier to study a small transparent embryo, it's been very hard to visualize the uterine structure. For example, in the mouse, the uterus is about two to three centimeters long and about one millimeter thick. Both mice and humans and mammals in general use the ovary to communicate to the uterus. The ovary secretes ovarian hormones, estrogen and progesterone. And these hormones bind to receptors on the uterus and that's how the uterus prepares for an incoming pregnancy. Just like humans have the menstrual cycle, mice have an estrous cycle. On the day of ovulation, the levels of estrogen rise and then they drop. For two days, the levels of hormones stays low. On day two and a half to three of, preg of the mouse pregnancy, the levels of progesterone start to rise and there's also a small increase in the amount of estrogen. This is when embryo attachment occurs. In terms of embryo location, it is known that on the morning of day three, the embryos, which are these red circular structures, enter the uterine lumen, which is the green um, structure here. And uh, the blue here is mesenchyme or stroma. The yellow structures are histological view of uterine glands and the red structure is the muscle. These embryos then move through the uterine horn and somehow evenly separate. Uterine contractions are thought to contribute to the separation of the embryos. Fluid resorption occurs from the stroma that pushes the wall of the uterine lumen together, locking these embryos in place and then they attach. While it is known that these uterine glands are really important, for delivering secretions to these embryos, how the glands are connected to the uterus and uterine lumen and the embryo and how these secretions reach the embryo is not well known. In terms of three-dimensional or whole tissue structure, uh, a blue dye can be injected at the time of attachment or little after, and the site of implantation can be visualized as a blue dye reaction. In the mouse, there are two different ovarian horn, the uterine horns as opposed to a single uterine chamber. So 
shown here are the two horns in the mice that are the ovaries are up at the top and the horns are connected down at the cervix. It is interesting to note that the number of embryos in each horn can vary and the spacing between embryos in each horn is independent of the other horn. For example, in this case, in the left horn, there are about nine embryos that are spaced close together based <clears throat> on the distance that's available in the uterine horn. On the other hand, in the right uterine horn, there are five embryos and they are spaced far apart compared to the, left, the horn on the left. And this is because they have more space available in this horn. So what we want to understand is how embryos move through the uterine lumen, find a spot for attachment, what makes a good Im implantation site, and how does the uterine structure contribute to the embryo finding a good site for implantation. The methods that we use are removing the uterine tissue from the mouse, staining for epithelial markers uh, using immunofluorescence. We clear the tissue and then use optical imaging, uh, in our case, confocal imaging, to image through the whole length and thickness of the tissue. Once we acquire these images, we process them our, on our image of analysis software, IMARIS, to recreate 3D structure and do our quantitative analysis. Here are two uterine horns joined at the cervix at the bottom. The ovaries would be up at the top here. The red is the very tortuous part, path of the uterine lumen, and the yellow structures are the uterine glands. Gray is just a nuclear marker that stains all the cells. So as I said, we are able to image the entire length and entire thickness of the uterine horn, but in addition, we are also able to recognize and stain for the embryo. So right here, which is magnified here, is the blastocyst. The inner cell mass is right here. The embryo is attached on one side while it's still not attached on the other side. On the top right-hand corner is another implantation site. Once we acquire these images on the confocal, we process the images and do a subtraction of signal. While we can stain for all the epithelium and the glandular epithelium, we don't have a good marker for just the luminal epithelium. So we computationally remove the glandular signal from the total epithelial signal. This gives us just the luminal signal. In the next slide, I'm going to show you a 3D reconstruction video of a segment of a uterine horn. We won't be able to see the muscle because we have cleared the tissue and we will be able to see the glands as colorful structures, but when we remove the glands, we will also be able to see the uterine luminal tube in blue. And um, this segment can be repeated over and over again, and I'm gonna choose one segment with one single embryo. The embryo is present somewhere in the middle, and this is, as I said, a 3D reconstruction of the 2D optical slices. The blue is the lumen, and hopefully you can appreciate that the lumen is very folded. As I play the video, the embryo is present in the middle and the region is pretty flat, and we can quantify the folding of the lumen. When we look at the colorful glandular structures, we see that the structures on the left are bending towards the middle, and the structures on the right are also bending towards the middle where the embryo is present. For the purposes of this talk, I will be talking more about the uterine lumen and the movement of the embryo throughout the uterus. So does, is the uterus pre-patterned? Are the folded and the flat regions pre-patterned into the uterus or are they prepared differently every, in every single pregnancy? In order to figure that out, we did a time course and stained a non-pregnant uterus, a uterus at day two, day three, and day four. And we saw that in a non-pregnant and day two uterus that does not have any embryos, there are folds in the uterine lumen, but they are random. At day three, the folds start becoming very oriented and patterned. And at day four, as I showed in the video, the embryo is present in a relatively flat region and it's surrounded by folded regions. When looking back into the literature, there's actually evidence of this kind of folding about 20 years ago in a rat study where they stained the epithelium with alkaline phosphatase and they saw something very similar that at day one, their folds are randomly oriented. At day three, the folds are very 
perpendicular to the long axis of the uterus. And at day four, the embryo is at the implantation site. The region is pretty flat. And the region on either side of the embryo, which is also known as the interimplantation site, is folded in C-shapes. We wrote a MATLAB script to and integrated it with IMARIS to quantify the folding pattern. So anything that's in red is very folded and regions in blue and green are relatively flat. So we know that the uterus and the lumen folds. And the question is, is it useful or relevant or what is the purpose of this folding? So we went back into the literature and looked for genetic mutants where the luminal structure seems to be disrupted based on 2D histology. The wind 5 a ROR1, ROR2 signaling pathway seemed to fit this kind of phenotype. In a control, when the uterine lumen is sectioned and stained for H&E, there are these evaginations that run from the M to the AM pole. The M is the mesometrial, the top, and the AM is the anti-mesometrial pole. And these evaginations are perpendicular to the long axis. In the ligand, which is when 5A loss of function uteri, the patterning is lost. And so is it, it is also lost in the receptor loss of function, as shown here. So we decided to acquire these mutants and look at these structures in 3D. So as I presented earlier, in controls, the lumen is patterned from M to AM, and the uterine lumen folds in a perpendicular manner, along, uh, perpendicular to the long axis. In the ligand loss of function, the folds are actually along the oviductal cervical axis. And in the ROR1, ROR2 loss of function, there are folds that are partially perpendicular and partially parallel. So the 3D actually reveals that um, the ligand and the receptor are having a different kind of effect, but both of them result in loss of this old pattern perpendicular folds. Um, the authors of the paper have shown that both in the ligand and in the receptor loss of function, pregnancy is lost around day 10 or 11, but perhaps the cause of loss of pregnancy is the defective events at the time of implantation. Currently, we are exploring how aberrance in the folding pattern can affect the embryo attachment and implantation and how this could lead to poor pregnancy outcomes. Next, we wanted to investigate how does the embryo move through the uterine horn and how it finds a site for implantation. So as I mentioned earlier, it is known that embryos enter the uterine horn on the morning of day three. So we decided to run a time course and collect fixed tissue um, on the day three of pregnancy at um, regular intervals. So this here is a video of optical slices collected from a midnight sample at, on the morning of day three. This is right here is the ovary. This is the oviductal uterine junction, and then the, that's the length of the uterus. The movie will zoom in to this portion, which is the presumed oviductal uterine junction, and the optical slices will display the location of the embryos. Because we stain with ECAD, we can tell that this is patterned oviductal epithelium and the embryos, these circular structures, are all present in the oviductal side of the oviductal uterine junction. The C shape here is the beginning of the uterus and none of the embryos are delivered into the uterine lumen yet. Also note that the oviductal lumen is open. If you look at the Three hours later, three hours later, the embryos are collected in the uterine lumen and the oviductal junction closes. So we collected many, many uteri at all these different time points, and I'm going to collectively show the data in this graph. Each circle here is an embryo, and circles in the same line are embryos that were found in the same uterine horn. The number here represents the number of uterine horns that we have looked at. So on the morning of day three at midnight, the embryos are either in the oviductal or in the uterine part of the oviductal uterine junction. 
three hours later, they are delivered and they are in the early part of the uterus. The embryos start to move, mostly in clusters. By 9 a.m., all the embryos arrive in the middle of the uterine horn and stay there in clusters. They are still there in clusters at noon. At 3 p.m., half of the horns have started to scatter, whereas the other half still remain clustered. At 6 p.m., all the horns begin to scatter and separate in both directions. Spacing starts to acquire evenness at 9 p.m. At midnight on the morning of day four, the embryos begin to attach. And by 6 p.m. on day four, they start to show a blue dye reaction as I had shown very early on. So we classified visually these, the movement of the embryo in three stages. Embryo entry, unidirectional movement of embryo clusters, and then a bidirectional movement that causes scattering and eventual spacing of the embryos, followed by embryo attachment. So while we can visually classify this, we wanted a more robust method of classifying the movement of the embryo. So we did two kinds of measurements. We measured the distance between the embryos, and we also measured the distance between the embryos and the oviduct. So the blue color represents earlier stages on the morning of day three, white represents midday stages, and red represents um, evening and attachment and post-attachment time points. So when we plot the distance between one embryo and the next embryo, or the oviduct and the embryo, we get this plot. What we see is, using k-means clustering, that there are three clusters. Either when the embryo-embryo distance is low, and the OE, the oviduct embryo distance is low, that's the entry phase. Then there are uteri that are in a stage where the oviductal embryo distance begins to increase, but the embryo embryo distance stays very low. And that's the unidirectional clustered movement phase. And then the third cluster is when embryo embryo distance starts to increase and oviduct embryo distance is also high. When we take all the embryos post attachment and plot embryo embryo distance mean along with the number of embryos in the horn, we get a very good correlation. This suggests that implantation sites are not predetermined. They are actually determined once the number of embryos are counted. In a non-pregnant uterus, there are no predetermined implantation sites. Another thing we wanted to test is the embryo-embryo distance and the coefficient of variation of the embryo-embryo distance. What we learned from there is that when the embryos enter initially and when they are moving initially in the first phase, the distribution can be random. But as the embryos approach the implantation attachment time points and after that, the distribution of embryos cannot be explained by a random event, which means there is an organized way to distribute the embryos along the uterine horn. Now this kind of distribution can either be due to uterine function, embryo-uterine interactions, or embryo function alone. Or it could be that all three of these factors contribute to this organized distribution or the non-random distribution of embryos along the uterine horn. Since contractions, uterine muscle contractions, have been proposed to allow for embryo movement, we wanted to figure out if muscle contractions are responsible for all these different movements. In order to do that, we decided to use a muscle relaxant. So as I showed previously, at 3 a.m., the embryos are right outside the oviductal uterine junction in clusters. We decided to relax the muscle at this time and evaluate the location of the embryos about 12 hours later. The muscle relaxant was given twice in order to keep the muscle relaxed over the period of 12 hours. If the embryos are affected by the muscle relaxant and unable to move, they should be stuck right outside the oviduct. But instead, if the embryos are not dependent on muscle contractions for this first phase of movement, they should either be as clusters in the middle of the horn or they should be scattered along the horn. We saw that with vehicle treatment, the embryos were either clustered in the middle of the horn or they were scattered along the horn. 
But with the treatment of muscle relaxant, most of the embryos were present in the first third of the uterine form. This suggests that the first phase of movement, the unidirectional clustered phase, is dependent on muscle contractions. In order to test if the second phase of movement is dependent on muscle contractions, we decided to give the muscle relaxant once the embryos arrived in the middle of the horn, that is around noon on day three. And then we evaluated the location about eight or nine hours later. We saw that in both vehicle treatment and muscle relaxant treatment, embryos were able to scatter and space along the uterine horn. This suggests that the second phase of embryo movement is independent of muscle contractions. In order to investigate what might affect or impact the second phase of embryo movement, we searched the literature for genetic mutants that might suggest a lack of one of these movements. We came across the LPAR3, LPA, LPR3 signaling pathway. LPA is lysophosphatidic acid and binds to receptor 3 specifically in the uterus. When this gene is deleted and control embryos are transferred, the embryos are not able to space out at the time of attachment. And instead of scattered or having these um, clusters or overcrowded clusters along the uterine horn, they tend to um, overcrowd near the cervical portion, near the cervix. So we decided to again look into these mutants and this is at the time of attachment, so later on day four. So the question is, can these embryos do the first movement and do they get stuck before the second movement? So when we evaluate the location of embryos in these mutants and their uh, littermate controls at about noon, about most, about 60% of the embryos are stuck in the middle. And in the knockout, the embryos are stuck in clusters, either in the middle of the horn or near the cervical segment. So we use this three segment distribution method to figure out if the embryos were in the middle or towards the cervix. So the embryos can move in the first phase, they remain as clusters, but instead of stopping in the middle, they tend to go a little bit past the middle. However, these embryos then stay stuck there. While the controls can scatter and space out by 6 p.m. or 9 p.m. on day three, the knockouts tend to stay as clusters either in the middle or in the cervical portion. This suggests that for the unidirectional clustered phase, the LPA-LPR3 signaling pathway fine tunes the movement and prevents the embryos from going past the middle. But later for the second phase of movement, the bidirectional scattering and uh, spacing phase, the embryos in the LPR3 knockout cannot absolutely move in that phase. So it is absolutely essential for the second phase of the movement. To summarize, we see that there are two kinds of movement for the embryos along the oviductal cervical axis, a unidirectional clustered movement and a bidirectional scattering or spacing movement along the uterine horn. This leads to eventual movement of embryos to the antimesometrial pole and implantation. Smooth muscle contractions contribute to the first phase of movement and LPA, LPR3 contribute to the bidirectional scattering and spacing along the oviductal cervical axis, so the second phase of movement. In order to understand what ties both the folding that I also showed you in the first part of the talk, which is essential for embryo implantation, and these movements, we are currently investigating how ovarian hormones, estrogen and progesterone, regulate the folding and or the muscle contractions to regulate the movement. Finally, now that we have understood and quantified the patterns of movement in the mice, we wanted to compare it to other mammals and their known patterns. So from the literature, we summarized that in both rats and rabbits, embryos start out as clusters, but the clusters begin to scatter as they move unidirectionally along the uterine horn. On the other hand, our data shows that in mice, the embryos move to the center of the horn and spend some time there before they bidirectionally space out. 
This is an important phenomena, and it says that evolutionarily, different species may have adapted by different mechanisms to achieve embryo, even embryo spacing. Understanding how hormones regulate the separation and spacing of the embryos is essential because this can help us understand and probably modulate movement of embryos when, for example, they're transferred back into the uterine space in IVF. And so currently we are investigating how hormones can impact the movement pattern of embryos in mice. I would like to thank my team. The folding part of the uterine horn, that part of the project is being conducted by a graduate student, Manoj Madhavan. Uh, the project on embryo movement, which is now under revision, was conducted by a talented research assistant, Diana Flores. Thank you.